uh, I guess we can start on that on a happy note then. So um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Youth Day webinar presented to you by International School Dhaka. I'm Tanzif Chaudhary, and this is Faiza Farheen, and the two of us will be your hosts for this evening. On this occasion of International Youth Day, who better to have a conversation with than two of the most inspiring individuals in our country who are empowering the youth of the nation every step of the way with their trailblazing leadership. So our, one of our guests for this evening is Mr. Corby Rakshan, the founder of Jago Foundation. So Jago works relentlessly in the education sector, particularly through their digital school platform to bridge the gap between urban and rural education. Um, Jago has received the 2016 UNESCO King Hamad bin Isal Khalifa Prize for their innovative use of ICT in education. And the youth wing of Jago is Volunteer for Bangladesh, so which is currently the largest youth platform in the country with approximately 35,000 people in 32 districts. Our second guest for today is Mr. Avita Noir, who has recently created history by winning the UAE Pro Championships GT86 this year, becoming the first ever Bangladeshi racer to win an international motorsport event, inspiring youth to chase their passion. Mr. Avik first made headlines back in 2019 when he became the champion of the Volkswagen Amio Cup in India. Later that year, he secured third position in a Malaysian race circuit. He's also the co-founder of Driven, which is Bangladesh's first ever premier motoring show and a platform for motoring-based visual media in the country. So we'd like to start off the webinar with by speaking with you, with you two regarding both of your journeys. So where did the two of you start your journey and where did you grow up and what exactly inspired you to follow your passions? I'll let Corvi take the lead. Okay, thanks, Abhi. <clears throat> uh, so I, I would say there's a specific time when the journey started, but uh, when I was in school, I used to do small fundraising and give it to poor people, did it for some time. Uh, later on, I realized that the money that I was giving to the families, uh, they were actually becoming more idle, they stopped working because there's someone who's giving them money. So I needed to do something that is more sustainable and education can be the best solution. So from there, I thought that maybe we can provide education. But because I grew up in Dhaka, I did not have a clear idea about uh, Bangladesh. So I started traveling in many parts. And then I met some young kids. Uh, they were playing beside a garbage can. I asked them, will they play with me? They said they're working, so they're collecting trash, they're collecting pieces of paper, bottles, they sell, and that's how they earn their uh, living. So I told them that I'll pay for the day. So we had a fun day, they agreed, uh, we did some paintings, we had good food. While I was coming back, the seven-year-old girl, she grabbed my hand and she said, sir, thank you for the day. It was a, a, a Bangla conversation. And her second uh, uh, thing that she said was, I don't have a family, I don't have a house, I don't have a place to go, will you take me with you? And I was like, if I take her today, maybe my parents will kick me out of the house or what do I say, who is she? But I also felt that what's the point of so much education and doing, uh, knowing so much pe uh, powerful people, if I can even help a child who's seven years old. From there, I promised myself that I will come back uh, because it was outside Dhaka, I told my friends, and that's how the journey started. In very short, that was the turning point of my life uh, to become a part of Chat. Thanks. Well, my journey uh, started when I was a little kid. Uh, my dad's in the car business, so I, I was used to seeing cars all my life. In fact, my fondest memory with Corvi here is we, we used to have class parties, right? So my, I told my dad, I, I need a convertible to go to the class party. And when I picked Corby up, he was really happy. He was like, wow, we're in grade three. So cars really did a spark in me all throughout my life. And then when I used to watch Formula One back in 99 or 98, 
uh, we didn't have cable back then. Like we need to hire cable services from providers and they were very rare. And most of them didn't even put the sports channel out. So I told my dad, I need to watch this Formula One. So why don't you, you know, buy a dish of our own so that I can watch it. And he saw I was very enthusiastic about it. And he, he put a dish on the roof so I could watch Formula One. From then on, I told him I want to be a race car driver, but constricted by society and him not knowing what a race car driver is properly, he said, no, you study economics and then you take it from there. So while I was studying economics in Canada, I, I used to go to the track. I used to do two jobs to buy a track car. And I would go through the most horrible conditions in those part-time jobs. Being a student, I used to deliver pizzas at minus 30, minus 40 in Toronto in the winter, but that paid off because people would be like very sympathetic when you deliver pizza at those temperatures, they'd be like, oh, here's $10. The, the pizza was $10 itself, but the tip was $10 too. So that really paid off. And then I used to go to the track on and off. And then the Bangladeshi racing series happened, Rallycross Championship in 2014, 15, 16. I was the underdog in 2014, but I won that. And then consequent years, I, I kept winning those. And then the organizer said, you know, we have to ban you if you're, <laughs> if you're winning all the championships consecutively. So then I decided I should go international. And in 2017, I went to India to participate in the AMIO Cup. 17 and 18, I, I couldn't get any success because mostly because I was distracted by social media and such. So in 2019, I decided I'll turn my phone off for the weekend, no business, no social calls, nothing. And I focused and I was the first Bangladeshi to win an international race. So from then on, success, you know, kept coming back because I was very serious about it. And I actually pursued all that needed to be done. Once you go international, you know, the competition is huge. So, you know, I persevered and I focused and I, I got the results. And this is, this has led to where I am today. And this has led to the birth of Bangladeshi racing chapter being successful globally. Well, oh, thank you. Definitely really um, amazing to hear how your personal lives have kind of shaped um, and kind of impacted the choices you've made growing up. And I guess introspection kind of played a huge role in between like both of your stories. Even Mr. Ford, we had this thought of, oh, um, this girl wanted to come and join me along where, and then Mr. Avik thought that if I'm so interested in racing, you know, why not take it forward? So I guess introspection and of course that spark that you do both have um, within you for your respective fields have definitely created a huge impact and on the choices you've made and the people that you have become today. So um, of course, both of you are so successful in your respective fields and definitely constantly inspired the youth all over the world, not only in Bangladesh to follow their passion, but as um, Mr. Avik mentioned, I guess in the beginning, it certainly wasn't easy. Um, I know for Avik, Mr. Avik that it had started out as a kid with a Toyota EX4, if I'm not wrong. Yes, you're and correct. Is, was it a Toyota EX4? Yes. Great. Um, and I think for Mr. Ford, it started with um, 17 children, a carpet, and a whiteboard. So, and now it has kind of expanded to 12 fully functional branches and catering to more than 3,000 children. And for Mr. Avi, with the kid with the Toyota EX4, now has gone into, you know, several years down the line, winning international championships. So, kind of seeing now, it may seem that, oh, yes, they have followed their passion, they have followed the path, but it certainly wasn't easy. You guys definitely had a lot of challenges that you had to overcome. So... What were some of those challenges and while, which you faced while kind of being on the staff to follow your passion and, you know, achieve your dreams? Corby first. Um, so uh, challenges or failure is something that will follow you your whole life. <clears throat> you can't say I have succeeded and I will not fail. If you, if you think like that, that's when you start failing. Initial days, definitely, it was even harder. So for me, I will say that um, charity work is expected when you have a lot of money at the age of 50 or 60, and then you just give away. But I took it the complete different way that it's not about money, it's about my time and energy. When I, I'm old, I don't have that energy anymore. So when I'm young, maybe I can do that. 
And in Bangladesh, like 15 years ago, uh, today you see so much startup and new organization. It wasn't like that. So it, uh, I will say money was the secondary issue, but the first problem was the mindset of the people. And that started from my family. So after I completed law, my parents gave me a choice of whether their business or my madness. And my picking up my madness means I have to leave home. So I did left my home and I stayed in the life of the slum you know, for school for nine years. So I, I'm not encouraging everyone that, oh, everyone should leave home. That's not the message that I'm trying to give. But my problem was that I never also shared my dream with my parents. My parents never shared their dreams with me. So we were walking parallelly, which never end. So to, to the young people who are listening, passion is not a problem, but communicate with the people. So that was my biggest struggle to make my parents, my family, my friends. My friends started, uh, stopped receiving my phone calls because they thought, Maybe I'll ask for money because I'm doing charity work. So different people have different perceptions. So <laughs> till the first award, it was quite hard to make people understand or take the work seriously. And, and it takes some time um, uh, to actually show success. So that, that's my part. Thank you. Short and sweet. He's saying everything short and sweet. So my journey is a bit different to his. We both come from impoverished families, but none of us took support. So when my racing career started, um, I, I wanted help from my dad a little bit, but he made it crystal clear he's not gonna, gonna help. So I went to sponsors, but me being the underdog in the local championship, none of them sponsored me. So when we do, did a first time lap in the rally cross of 2014, I came fourth, not even first. And everyone's everyone was like, oh, he talks all about racing and stuff, but he, he can't get the job done. So that really got to me. And on the second round out, my elder brother, he told me, bro, break the car, but win the race. He said, do whatever it takes. So I took that as an inspiration and, and I went flat out. Like when, it, when I said flat out, I went flat out. And then I beat the first place guy by three hundredths of a second being in an underpowered car with no sponsors. So that felt really good. And uh, after the first award, it, it became like an addiction. So I would look for sponsors. I would try to, you know, cajole them. Like say, if I had a lubricant sponsor, I would tell them, you know what? I would buy this amount of lubricant this year. And then you can pay some of that money for my sponsorship. Because in Bangladesh, scoring sponsors is very hard. Nowadays, a lot of you comes to me and they're like, oh, can you help us out with some sponsors? but they never understand how hard it is to convince sponsors. Once you are there established, then they come with the money. They're like, oh, now we want to sponsor you. But in your struggling years, you're very unlucky to find sponsors and racing is very expensive. So when I went to international, uh, Mr. Cookie, uh, they sponsored me, Hawk Group of Industries. And I actually had to maintain a very, very good relationship with uh, the owner of Mr. Cookie. So that he sponsors me and I had to tell him, look, this is, this is something patriotic. So when I went in 2017, I didn't win anything. And my, my friend, Tami Mikbal, all of you know who he is, is the captain of the national cricket team. He would be like, he came to my uh, office one day and he's like, why do you go racing? Um, you don't win anything. Like he was actually trying to inspire me, but by not saying that. So that really got to me. And I'm like, yeah, I, I need to win. So I told him, look, dude, you didn't win anything when you first started, you know, your wins came after, after a long time. So give me some time. I'll, I'll, go, I'll be there. I'm developing myself. And eventually when it came, he's the first person I called. I'm like, I won. And then he was so happy, him being a big celebrity, he shared it. And like all the papers, they published it. And like, it was hard. If he was not my friend, I would not get this much popularity or the inspiration. My parents are there for me mentally, but as I said, they're constricted by what society thinks. So when, when, when we are young, we always think like our parents said, don't do this, don't do that. But we have dreams. The day I have kids, I'll tell them, do whatever you want. I'll support you. Instead of being like, don't do this, don't do that. Unless, I mean, they're into drugs or something illegal. I'll say no. But anything that's legal, I would support them with all my heart. So, yeah. 
yeah, it's it is really inspiring to hear how you've combated your different challenges. I mean, I think with dedication and then with the willpower you have, both of you, I think it was definitely possible to overcome such adversities. I think they really do shape you into the individuals you are today. So do you think that reflecting back, like you could have done anything differently with the way you've dealt with your different challenges? Or is there any advice you would give back to your former self? Carvey first. Um, honestly speaking, I won't say that I have any regrets um, because even if I have any, there's no point of doing it. So I, I'll take it. I, I always take things like this happened because there's a reason. But advice, I will say that everyone wants a shortcut in life. There's nothing called shortcut in life. The first day, like the story that Abit was saying, he did not become the champion on the first day. People did not accept what Jago was doing on the first day. It took us a long time. And in, in, in the whole time, I will say that I have failed many times. Initially, when I started the foundation, I thought we will provide uh, the best curriculum for the most unprivileged children, which is we did all of this. We thought that's the best. Maybe the best is not the most suitable. So we had to change the curriculum and we went to the Bangladesh government's English curriculum, which is more suitable. So the first choice was the, the wrong thing. But it, I won't say it's a wrong thing. It actually opened a new door, a new way. So you might fail, but don't give up. You know that you're one step uh, near success. So there will be a lot of failures. For me, when I, I went out, yes, definitely I was very angry that why aren't my parents understanding? But honestly speaking, it came as a blessing in this game. Why? Because when I went there, I actually started staying with these people who are in poverty. I wasn't born there. So I had to start living their life to understand poverty is not in their stomach, it's in their mindset. So these are very important things. When you do something, you know, when you want to do something, uh, try, first of all, do not just copy another person. Oh, this is the most trending thing right now, so let's go and do it. Uh, let's have a camera and let's, let's start taking selfie or let's get a bike and start uh, cycling. So there are a lot of trends that we have seen. So yes, it's good to be the trend, but ask yourself, what is your passion? That will actually take you to the next level. And do a bit of research. Create a team. Usually, like, obviously that's a different case. It's, it's a one-man show. But usually when you're working, you need a team. And I'm sure there are also, we also have a, maybe have a team of people who inspires him, who works with him. Maybe he's the, he's the one who's driving. So that is very important that if you can actually work together. So that's like my short um, experience sharing. I won't say advice. I have so much to learn. Success is nothing near. Like, I will believe that the first day of when the Jago kid gets a job, that's the day I will see that, okay, a child from the slum is getting a job in a proper company. That's That will be my first ever child. Still have to wait another four years. The kids are now just entering university. It's another four years. Thank you. The, what he does is so inspiring. I'm inspired by his work since like the last decade. So um, what I would have done differently is I would have pursued my dreams earlier. I should have gone international a lot earlier, but I'm grateful for what I achieve. And I, I will quote my dad here. Whenever we used to do something, he used to tell us siblings, whatever you do, put your 100% in it. If you don't put your 100% in it, don't do it. Just don't do it. So when I started anchoring uh, for independent television back in 2012, they they hosted the first automotive review show. It was called iDrive. Um, they put us under scorching heat to review cars. And by the time we were done shooting, I was seven shades more darker. But I stood there and it was without any pay because I needed a break. So they gave me my first big break and I stood by that channel despite like very low remuneration for nine years. After that, I started my own show with my own team. And like Orvi said, teamwork is dream work. Whenever we race, this is the motto we follow. Like I respect every mechanic who works on the car. I try to be very friendly with them. It's not like, oh, 
I, I'm the star, I'm the driver. No, in, in a racing team, everyone's the star because every little thing matters. So we go on a very team-based format and there are various uh, racism that I faced. Uh, when I won in UAE, they told me how you're from Bangladesh. You guys don't even have a racetrack. And then in Malaysia, when I won in, oh, sorry, when I came on the podium in Sepang Formula One circuit, they couldn't believe the fact I was from Bangladesh. They were like, oh, uh, your country is just labors. I'm like, no, that is not what my country is. There are people in this country who are achievers and I am one of them. I actually said that on the podium. So, and the, the most friendly faces that I saw was in India. They actually help you. They're actually, when I won the race, all my Indian racer friends, they're really happy. They're like, whoa, finally you won. And they're all clapping. You could see the joy in their faces. So there are a lot of positives and negatives that you face in life. But the main factor is you overcome them. Like my agenda to any problem is if I'm two steps ahead of the problem, I don't care what the problem is. I'm two steps ahead of it. So I always live life by this practice. Like I have work, I'll finish the work first. Then I'll, I'll do my leisurely activities. So yeah, short and sweet like Garvey. Uh, honestly, I guess what we can kind of take away from what we both just said is um, it is hard and it will always be hard. But one thing that you always have to continue doing is persevere and, you know, just keep on doing what you do best. And I think that kind of is uh, another segment to our next question, which is the fact that I guess youth nowadays are in a dilemma of in between the thing that should I follow my passion or should I just lead my life based on the conventions of society that may be a nine to five or follow family business? And honestly, it's because of the fact that how, um, how uncertain this whole process is, you know, for Mr. Corby founding this organization, it, it, there wasn't a full on plan that said, okay, first step, I have to do this. Second check, I do this. Same for Mr. Avik. There, there isn't a set plan that you follow and, it's guaranteed success. And it kind of makes the youth question, is it all worth it? Because it's hard. And it, and when certainly when people don't understand what you're doing, they don't value your work, it gets even harder. So I feel like um, our next question would be, how do you think the youth in our country should be supported when they decide to follow their passion? I'll just share one or two points here. See, the problem I see right now is we are pushing every young person to become entrepreneur. We're asking everyone, like, go and do something, uh, start do a startup. See, everyone cannot be entrepreneurs. Then who are the people who are becoming the team lead, uh, team members? So I think this is the wrong trend that that we're pushing to young people. Rather, uh, everyone cannot be the face of the organization. There, there are people who work behind the back. There are people who work in front of the camera. So this thing, we're trying to make everyone look like the glamorous. Like, oh, look at Mark Zuckerberg. Look at Bill Gates. See, there's only one Mark Zuckerberg. There's only one Bill Gates. And we give the example of them to 7 billion people. So that's not right. That's a wrong information that we're giving to young people. So if someone wants to get a nine to five job and they don't want to take the risk, that is fine. Why do we have to give an example of another person and say, see, they are doing it. So I think let the young people decide what they want to do rather than pushing them. Uh, we have to stop saying that, okay, everyone can be uh, entrepreneurs. And even like when I talk, talk about leadership, you don't have to be on the top to become a leader always. In your position, if you do work sincerely, even if you're working in a company, if you do your part, that is also leadership. That is your circle of leadership. So this is something that my advice to young people is, not everyone has to go and start something new. You don't have to do something unique every time. You can just ask yourself, you might not be the person who wants to take that extra mile. You want to go and do a distant job, then it's fine, go ahead. Don't listen to people. Ask yourself what you want to do. 
furthering to what Corby said, which was excellent. Um, now there's like this societal cool factor. Oh, this is cool, so I have to do this. Um, at the end of the day, when you end up doing the cool things, you may not be as successful as the other cool person that you're trying to follow. So ask yourself actually what you're passionate about. Follow your passion. Like I'll, I'll tell you an example from myself. Uh, my I wear specs and this I is minus 11.5 and this is minus four. So I'm myopic and I'm not fit for racing. I broke this hand five times and this seven times during racing. And every time I was asked to stop by my family or friends, come on, stop it. It's very dangerous. But I persevered because I'm passionate about it. When you're passionate about something, success will come. But if you're just doing it because it's cool, because your mentor does it, that's not going to lead to a lot of success because you actually need to be hardcore passionate about it. And now my knees are starting to fail. So I don't know how I'll tackle this and still race. But I, I will race till like I'm 40 or 45 and then I'll stop. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I do completely agree with the points you two have made. I think it's really become some sort of a trend for everyone to just push forward and then just, I know, uh, for example, like become an entrepreneur and then make a difference in society. And then I think there's also like a proverb that's um, not too many cooks and not enough chefs as well. So I think that's a, that's a really famous proverb. And I think it really does make sense in this situation. I think if too many people um, try to outshine one another and look into each other's successes and compare it with one another, it really does detract from the main point you're trying to make and the main motive you're all trying to achieve. So I think you've both really accomplished a lot in your lives um, so far. Um, congratulations to you both. But what do you, what Thank are your you. plans now for going forward? Carvey first. Um, um, you mean with, with the work that we do? Yeah, yeah with your work. Um, particularly for us, I think we went, uh, we're going through a very challenging time. Uh, see, our, it's, it's all about our schools and young people's training and empowering them. For the last one and a half year, the schools are closed. But we were lucky that 10 years ago, before the pandemic, like how we are talking right now, this is, we, this is how we take classes for the last 10 years. So it was easy when the pandemic came to convert the whole situation. Uh, people laughed at us when we started this in 2010-11, teaching through Skype. Zoom didn't exist at that time. So, um, and today this, this has become the normal thing, even for doing office or any, anything. Uh, so our focus right now is to uh, help the government, the education system, how we can digitize it, because um, there are so many dropouts happening. There will be more dropouts when the school opens. So, that's one part of our work to make sure that we can take, bring back their children at school. And not only the 4,000 kids of Jaco, but even the government schools, we know that Bangladesh is very central, like everything is in Tata. So the good teachers, the good opportunities, everything is based in Tata. So how can we take those opportunities outside, especially the qualified teachers? So we can't physically take them, but virtually it's possible. At least COVID has proven that it is possible. So. So that's something that we're focusing on. And the other thing is um, uh, the young people that we work with, we have around 40,000 young people right now. We are based in 51 districts right now, but by the end of this year, we want to go to 64 districts. So every district in Bangladesh should have a VBG, the Volunteer for Bangladesh team. And I'm not sure if you know, it's a democratic process, so I don't select them. They have election in their own districts and they are getting elected by their own people in that district. So they can care. So decentralizing uh, the power to young people and maybe for Dhaka, I can give you, I can tell you a very good suggestion. But for Thakurga, maybe I, I don't have the solution. So the young people from there should be in the leading role. So that's basically our, our plan of work. So with education to make sure that we can go to the last child and with young people, giving them the power, giving them the authority. Uh, they are today's leader, and they will lead tomorrow. We don't have much time. By 2030, the demographic dividend that we're having, that the number of young people are rising will stop.
10 years, nine and a half years left. So this is the time that we invest in our youth. After that, the number will start decreasing. So let's focus on our young people. So what I plan to do for the youth is to open a racetrack in Bangladesh. We recently started a dialogue with the Bangladesh police force where they would uh, accommodate some racing plans integrated into the local streets where there are no traffic or it's like they will seclude it for some racing purpose. But eventually the goal is to build a racetrack. And like Corvi said, you have to be, uh, you have to see into the future, which he did when he used to do classes online from a decade ago. So for me, I need to create a path so that the youth can actually have a playground to practice on. And uh, us Bangladeshis, we're very talented. It's, it's, not, it's not just being exploited, but we are very talented. So I'm pretty sure there are drivers who are faster than me, better than me. And I just want to create a platform where, you know, they can turn their dreams into reality. So I've been working on that and we are at the very initial stage, but some development will come by the end of 2022. Also, a lot of people question me or ask me questions about how, how can I be a racing driver, blah, blah, blah. It's very expensive to be a racing driver. I can't entertain all of their questions. That's why I'm creating a, a racing club in accordance to the local government rules and everything so that people can actually join a racing school and there are people who can answer all their questions. So yeah, that's, that's my wish and dream for the youth, to do racing safely and not to do street racing because people mostly associate racing with street racing. And I get a lot of messages. They're like, hey, Avik, do you want to race? I have this car, blah, blah, blah. And I just reply, hey, bro, you already won the race. I already lost because I am not going to do street racing. So yeah. Faiza and, and Zeke, um, why don't you tell us a bit about what's your passion or what you're doing or where are you heading right now? Yeah, both of you are very accomplished. So tell us, tell the audience what they're, you know, what they need to know because I shared the live on my page and there are a lot of people watching. So I would very much like for them to hear what you guys are about. I think Faiza can start and then I'll give my own. Um, I guess I'm inspired by um, you guys and a lot of the other leaders in our country. Um, I do have um, kind of found uh, my passion and calling in which is um, neurodiversity and working with children on the autism spectrum. And um, honestly, it has been such a fulfilling experience so far, seeing how um, seeing these children come together and actually kind of bridging that gap between the mainstream and uh, uh, the neurodivergent. And the fact that before we used to think that people are not going to come forward and try to create a change. But now seeing parents being so vocal about this and actually coming forward, it's, it, it actually, um, it's great that there's so much happening in the community. And we have also, with the help of youth all across um, Dhaka founded Project Independence, which basically helps um, young adults on the spectrum get employed. And so far we have um, around five, people um, in the, uh, talking in the works of getting you know, employed by Arom, Bragg, um, Hotel Serena. So the fact that these kids are so talented and are out there becoming independent and taking the reins of their future in their own hands, it's, um, it's just heartwarming and really inspiring to see. That's very commendable. I really respect you. Like very my good. respect has gone from here to here. Yeah, we all really admire the work Faiza has done. Um, yeah, so for me, I think a lot of my, so what I've focused on, a lot of it is actually related to education. So it would relate a lot to what Jago does. So what I've, so what I've centered a lot of what I've been doing on is looking into more of the humanitarian issues. So with a lot of my model UN experience, I've usually cho chosen committees that look into um, issues relating to poverty, so child marriage and then um, child labor and all of, so I've been very focused on those topics. So that's where I've chaired the committees over there and then I've just led those debates and participated in some of them on my own. So, and so that's what I've been doing most of my work on and then also towards 
providing, I guess, a political voice as well for the, for the underprivileged. So I've worked in student government for two years as well in our school. So, and I've also done an internship as well once, um, this one time at Alter Youth. So that's where, so just learning about how we can truly empower those who are voiceless and those who do not have much of a, much of a role to play in our political community as well. So that's where, what I'm also focusing most of my work on. What are your plans for the future? Um, plans for the future, um, I think becoming, so my target is to go into economics. So I'm thinking of becoming a developmental economic economist and then working possibly at an organization i wish you all the best may you get a nobel prize just like dr yunus thank you welcome and um honestly um i guess it's been such a enriching journey so far for all of us at school who are involved with the community and it's all thanks to um, leaders like you in our community who, who we look up to. And we get inspired every single day by all the work that you guys do. Um, uh, and for Jago, I guess ISD has partnered up with Jago um, numerous times and we've seen the kids come into school and have you know, sessions with them, have service days with them. So it's really fun seeing how different um, people in the community come together, create change, and just have a good time. Like I hopefully we're having right now. And yeah, I guess um, the next question for both of you would be that we heard about your future plans. Um, extremely important, very ambitious. And it showcases how much of a go-getter both of you are, you know, getting to achieve your goals, creating change, and just being out there and doing the things which you guys love doing the most. Now, how do you guys find that balance between, you know, work and life? Because especially during COVID, we have had a lot of time to then reflect, think back, take a pause. So how did you guys um, mutualize that time? And where do you guys find sanity in sometimes a very chaotic world? I guess Mr. Avik would go first. This time, if you want. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so when COVID struck, I had races lined up that year in 2020. I did only one race in India where I qualified third. I was the first Bangladeshi to qualify third ever in international race. So that race went well. I finished fourth, although I qualified third. And I had a full season of races planned in Malaysia and in UAE. But as soon as COVID struck, every race was canceled. And I, I went into a bit of depression. So then I realized, why don't I utilize the time? And I sat on my simulator every day for eight hours. I honed my skills almost to perfection level. So see, once you're on the simulator and you're perfect there, on the racetrack, you just need to tweak yourself a little bit. So that's what I did. And when I did the first race in UAE and I won the race, the team itself, they were like, nobody has come here and have never driven and has won a race. And for the full 40 minutes, the guy who was in second place, he was right behind me, he was overtaking me. He was ahead of me. I was overtaking him. It was like a dog fight all throughout. And after the race, they weigh us, right? And I lost two kilos of weight in water weight because I was so stressed and tense. And when I tell my friends that, they're like, oh, we should do racing so that we can lose weight. I'm like, no, it doesn't That's work exactly that way. what I was thinking right now. <laughs> so... Those were like difficult times, but I made the most out of it. I did lose my sanity at times because everything was like new. I didn't know what to do. Like I was so prepared for racing and I already told my sponsors, they were all on board and then they all backed out. So I needed to find new sponsors. Do, I, I needed to do another bit of cajoling to new people. So yeah, it was hard. It was hard, but I got over it. So yeah, that worked out. So 2020 and 2021 has been great. Despite the pandemic, I, I didn't give up. I worked and then, yeah, it happened. I think um, when you talk about work balance, I'm really bad at that. Because I stayed at Jago for nine, 10 years, inside Jago. So I wake up, it's Jago. I go to sleep, it's Jago. So 
Sometimes people will forget my name and just call me Jago. Come here, so so that happens. So, so for me, but but the good thing is that, um, and I will also ask everyone to think about it. If you can find your passion and work together, you think it is work. For me, uh, it it's never work that I have to go to office and to come back to office. It's more about that is what I am. Born for that, I, I enjoy doing it. Uh, you look at like things like that, life becomes easier. Because a lot of time, you might get a lot of money, you might get a lot of good paid job, but you didn't enjoy it. So finding that balance, I think that is my work balance. Even if I'm sick, if I am into work, I forget, and I usually get better. So that's my way of dealing with this, particularly with. During COVID, I think we became more uh, aggressive towards our work. Like, how can we actually end up helping people because there are people without food? We really didn't think what will happen if we were affected by COVID. Yes, we took the precaution, but when everyone was inside the house, usually in the April month, we were on the slums distributing food to the people. And until you hear the blessing, blessings from them, when you know that this person did not eat for the last 24 hours and they don't know when the next food will come, uh, it, it's like no less than getting that award. So I think that uh, keeps us going. Uh, but yes, also during COVID, there was a time when, when everything became blank for me because you know I have to do fundraise every day. We don't usually get money from the donors. It's like one person takes care of one child by paying twenty-seven dollars or two thousand taka a month. But during COVID, all these people were also financially hit, and most of the time, it's not the richest of the people. It's usually the middle class and the higher middle class who sponsors kids here because they they know the struggle of life. So a lot of people dropped out, and I'm not sure if if you guys know, but there's four hundred employees who works at Jag. And we couldn't give the salary for a month. That's that's when things became really hard. That okay, if I am not getting paid up for a month, I will be okay. That's fine. But some of the people, for them, this is their bread and butter. They they were on the street helping other people. What happens to them? So so those are the times you have to make choices. So we ask everyone, can we reduce the salary a bit so that everyone gets the money? It was a hard decision. And we had to do it for a few months, and then recently we got some sponsors. But those are the really hard decisions of life. Asking foreign people, can you uh, reduce the salary by ten percent so that we can pay everyone? These teachers, you know, uh, during COVID, our students don't have smartphones, so we call them. We call them and teach them through telephones, and we send them homework through SMS. And they have these old phones where it says you have to delete the message because there's a new message. That's the type of phone they use. So they go to the next house to ask someone, can you delete the message so that we can get the message? So life teaches us a lot of things. But again, Jago Digital closed down. We have every employee working. Everyone is happy again. But there are sometimes those balances. You go crazy, but you have to keep your sanity and look for it. Yeah, it really is truly great how you've dealt, how both of you have actually dealt with the pandemic. It is really. I have to add, yeah, something to what Corby said. Um, it's very commendable what he does. He's my friend since we, since we were in grade three, and I've seen his rise and and Jago rise. He faced a lot of repercussions, and people would be like, like there are adversities to what you do. So even if he does charity, people would be toxic about it. I faced that firsthand when the pandemic hit in 2020. So I collect a lot of uh, unique JDM cars. Like they're either one-offs in the country or something like that. So I, I had a Nissan Silvia S14. I don't know if you guys can relate to it. It's, it's a very famous drift car. And I was in the process of restoring it and then the pandemic hit. So I had to pay my employees for three months without any income. And then I sold the car to a friend of mine. And the time I was selling the car, my heart really, literally broke into pieces. 
But then I, I got it all back because I paid my employees and I fed people for every day for at least two months in the pandemic. People I did not know, people who were middle class who couldn't go to other people and say, hey, um, I need help. People like that. So I helped a lot of people and I, and I let one of my dreams go. I'm like, you know what? Allah will give back to me for doing this. So I did it. I actually let a Sylvia go just to help people. And Allah has rewarded me 10 times more than what I've given to people. Like, and during that period, I used to publish some of the photos and then people would be like, oh, you're such a show off. Why are you showing? It's to inspire other people. I only showed 10% of what I did. For Corby to do what he does, I'm pretty sure he faces a lot of adversity, but he's still doing it. And I now realize what a hard job that he has. He makes it look so easy being the person that he is from when he was a kid. But his job is the hardest amongst whatever we do right now, like including the, the three of us. So yeah, those, a huge salute to you. I hope I can support you in some way in the near future. I'm always here if you need help. Yeah, we really do. We truly admire the work that Mr. Corvi's done with Drago, especially. And um, the work you've done as well, it's really commendable. And I think what the pandemic's really taught us is the value of adapting. I think based on the situation, we've, we come up with new ways of dealing with it. And it's really taught us to adjust based on the adversity at hand. So I think um, the webinar should draw to a close very soon. So before, um, before we leave, we just wanted to ask you two a question for the youth of Bangladesh that are watching the webinar right now. So what advice do you have for all of the youth in the country as, at the moment? And what qualities do you think they should possess in order to pursue their respective passions? Me first or him first? I'll go first. Um, Whatever you guys do, make sure you guys are passionate about it. Don't be constricted by societal norms or boundaries that you face. If you're passionate, you'll find a way. You need to focus. You need to do what you want to do, not what society tells you to do. Convince your parents. Show them this video if need be. Show us both as examples of, of following our passions and dreams. Just do what you think is, you know, good for you and you're passionate about it. Don't do things that are cool. Don't do things that are temporary. Think permanent, think long-term, have a vision, do something for yourself, your country and the community. Because what most people don't get is the more you give, the more you'll receive. It's not like the less you give, the more you'll receive. So I live my life by that motto. I try to help a lot of people and Alhamdulillah, I've been able to do it and I'm very grateful to Allah for it. So yeah. Um, sorry, my electricity went off. So, <clears throat> um, so very similar to what Ovik said, um, find your passion, do a bit of research, how to achieve that, create a team, go for it. That's very similar to Ovik. One thing that I want to add is, see, when you get a gift, when we get a gift, what do we do? We keep it in a safe space, we clean it, we take care of the gift. This world is the best gift God, Allah, Bhagavan, however we want to name it, has given us. So together, we have to take care of it. Rather than saying someone else will, it's not my fault. Yes, it is our fault. So together, if we can take care of it, I think that should be good enough. Just be honest. Don't harm another person. Ask your heart what they want to do and go for it. Thank you. I guess that is a very optimistic note on which we have somewhat come to an end of the webinar today. And it really did teach us how um, there will be ups and downs in life. That's a given for sure. But you have to persevere, follow your heart. And as Mr. Avik mentioned, um, do the thing you want to do and not you know, follow anyone else or um, bind, get binded by um, societal conventions. And another thing that Mr. Corby mentioned would be how lucky we are that we have this gift and how we all should you know, try our best to uh, contribute and help 
preserve it. And I guess on that note, um, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure and an honor having this great conversation with you two. We really wish you both all the very best for all of your future endeavors. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. It truly was a pleasure speaking to the two of you. And as Bangladeshis, you brought a lot of pride into our country and have had such a big impact. So thank you. Thank you for having us. It was it was a pleasure. And I hope your work with autistic individuals reaches the next level. If you ever need any help or support from my end, I'm here for you. And if you need any advice on what courses to take in economics and how to go about it, I'm here for you. I have a master's in economics. Yeah, definitely. You guys were amazing. Wish you all the best with whatever you guys want to do, is doing right now. And thanks to ISD for hosting this. Uh, ISD and Jago has a long, long relationship from giving the auditorium to do your training, to bring the kids and spending fun time there. So uh, thank, thank you guys.